Warnham Nature Reserve. An expansive 13th century mill pond surrounded by reed beds, conifer plantations, ancient woodland and meadows. Lying on the outskirts of Horsham, West Sussex, this 92 acre reserve enjoys a bounty of habitats overflowing with hundreds of species of birds and beetles and plants, as well as a large flotilla of butterflies. This is a documentary about Warnham's inhabitants. The spring frost is beginning to melt at the dipping pond, and life is waking up. The first item on its agenda is to find a mate. This female coot has been successful in finding a suitor. Together, they guard their territory, the dipping pond. This pond is a good choice for many reasons. First, it is rich in things to eat. The coots dive for aquatic invertebrates and take pieces from the tops of the horsetails that dominate the pond. This pond is also good for construction, if you know what materials to build with. Longer pieces of vegetation are woven together by the pair to form the main structure while smaller fragments are used to seal the gaps. But the coots are not building a nest. They are making a display platform. It is on this platform that the coots will mate. When ready, the female will stand on their carefully constructed platform, signalling for the male to approach her. It is time for the pair to become parents. Now fertile and with a nest constructed, the female broods and lays her eggs. Although a clutch typically averages six eggs, this coot has laid a much smaller number. Now the parents must incubate the eggs, which they take in turns, one on sitting duty and the other feeding its nest-bound partner. Then, after many days of the pair switching between feeding and incubating, doing nest repairs and waiting, and waiting, and waiting, an egg hatches and a chick emerges. Now the hard work begins. This nestling is not quite ready to fledge and relies on their parents for food and warmth. Not only must the parents incubate the chick, there are now three mouths to feed and one of them is particularly demanding. This goes on for about a week before the chick decides to explore outside the nest. Out in the pond, under the watchful eye of mum or dad, the chick is learning learning about what it can eat and what it can't. Learning how to dive for invertebrates, or rather, watching Dad do it and eating his catches. Soon, the chick will master how to feed itself, and when fully mature, will need to find its own territory somewhere else. The reserve is crisscrossed with strange tracks, too narrow for human use or creation. These are deer paths. The UK has six species of deer, red, roe, muntjac, fallow, seeker, and Chinese water deer. Warnham is home to a small population of roe deer. 
only two females and one male have been spotted. The deer at Warnham are highly elusive, but if you tread quietly and peer down a deer track, you may just spot one. At night, there is a marked absence. There are no people on the pathways, there are no walkers near the woods. The shy begin to step out from their hiding places. One of the most captivating night explorers is the European badger. After spending all day underground, this badger is hungry. Being omnivores, badgers have a highly varied diet. They will happily consume fruits, roots, bulbs, bird eggs, and even small mammals. But they have one particular favorite, earthworms. One badger can tug out hundreds from the soil between dusk and dawn. The badgers will also busy themselves with scent marking the boundaries of their territories to make sure the other animals know to keep out while they sleep during the day. Most of Warnham's inhabitants are diurnal and the feeders are the social hub for many of Warnham's daytime workers. If you stay for long enough, it is likely you will see the full cast of garden birds you will find in your own back garden. Look closely and you will see that each species has its own feeding strategy. The great tip is up first. He takes the seed to a quiet spot and holds it between his claws, taking neat pecks from the grain. Then the blue tick comes along. He uses a similar method, but is much more hurried about things. This long-tailed tit takes a much less conventional approach. Goldfinches, despite what you may assume from their elaborate patterning, are very messy eaters. They chew with their mouths open and they like to dine together. A banquet fit for animals. Green finches are noticeably larger than their other passerine friends. Because of this, they tend to come higher up in the pecking order, or in other words, they are billies. The lesser red pole is a rare sight at Warnham, and she quickly grabs some food before disappearing. Nuthatches prefer to swallow their seeds whole, unlike this goldfinch, who scatters crumbs onto the ground below. With the ground littered with leftovers, it is not long before the ground feeding birds fly over to scout the area. This wren is a ground feeder, but she will happily choose insects over seeds. After a long time searching, she struggles to find enough insects in the grass. Maybe she will have more luck at the pond. This mallard has other ideas. Bored of pondweed, she waddles over to the feeders to look for seeds on the ground. Success. Rangers will often pour seeds out onto the soil, especially for the ground feeders. It is not only the charismatic garden birds that enjoy the bird food. Warnham's feeders are for the masses. After all, everyone has to eat. This includes grey squirrels, the enemy of many garden bird watchers. The greater spotted woodpecker also likes to eat at the feeders.
although, being much larger than many of the other birds, he is not particularly welcome to the feast. In fact, with his large wingspan and sharp talons, he tends to scare the others away. Ah well, all the more for himself. Although a useful source of food, Warnham's feeders can't completely sustain the birds, especially in spring, when the birds have chicks to feed. Notice that this great tit is not holding a seed. He has a caterpillar. Both great tit parents are on feeding duty, and the parents spend their waking hours hunting for insect larvae, spiders and small beetles in the trees. They must visit the nest to bring food up to 700 times in one day, which means that the parents must find and deliver food at a rate of almost one item every minute. It is exhausting. When the chicks finally fledge, their first trip is to the feeders. The juveniles must learn how to balance on the feeders and take seeds in order to survive on their own. Easier said than done. This chick has mastered it and flies away to eat her reward. Just like mum does it. The feeders are Warnham's canteen for the birds, but where do the insects, another bird food staple, eat? If you turn left after crossing the boardwalk, heading towards the woodpecker hide, you will find a quiet alley. But quiet does not mean lifeless. Hemlock spills over the grassy virtues. This member of the carrot family, while toxic to humans, is teeming with insects. Bees dart from plant to plant, pollinating the frothy inflorescences, allowing next year's verges to be equally fruitful. Flies drink down its sweet nectar using their proboscises as sponges to soak away the sweet liquid. Masquerading as wasps, hoverflies also enjoy a drink, and the way their tongues dab at the flowers gives away their true identity as flies. Magnificent longhorn beetles, with their antennae longer than the rest of their bodies, can also be found here. In fact, a whole host of insects find respite on top of the hemlock. But for the frog hopper, a tiny jumping insect, hemlock has a different role. This strange frothy structure is cuckoo spit. Frog hopper larvae are vulnerable to predation from spiders and other creatures. Cuckoo spit is a resistant coating provided by the frog of a mother to protect her young. Other insect larvae thrive among the hemlock. Caterpillars in particular love how the plant tastes. They gorge on the plant as they mature and as they do so, they wind the inflorescences with silk, pulling in the flowers to provide a hiding place from potential predators. Not only does the hemlock provide food for the insects, it also provides the scaffolding for the protective structures that the young make for themselves. Warnham's other insect hotspot is far better known, a habitat evoking memories of lazy British summers. Welcome to the meadow. For this common red soldier beetle, the summer is no time for being lazy. Summer is for finding a mate. Hopefully, potential mates will see past his clumsiness. Butterflies too, like this ringlet, mate during the warm months. The 
The meadow is an ideal habitat for breeding insects, with plenty of sugary nectar held within the meadow flowers. This painted lady has migrated all the way from Africa to pay the worn and meadow a visit, yet maintenance is required to keep the meadow at its best for its insects. It is winter at Warnham, and the reserve has some woolly visitors. This is a Hebridean sheep, native to Scotland. She is not here by accident. She was introduced by the rangers, and she has a special task to perform. She grazes on the low-lying hedgerows, and in doing so, she acts as a natural gardener. A Herdwick sheep joins in. She comes from the Lake District, and is happy to share the meadowland with her Scottish relative. Together, they browse the hedges for berries, plant twigs, and eventually the tougher and less appetising older branches. Over the winter, the shrubbery is pruned back, and come spring, young meadow plants can flourish in the absence of the shadowy thicket. This herdwick has an itch. She relieves herself by rubbing her behind against the bench. Her warm and dense coat is the perfect home for flies, and they are quite a nuisance. Ah, that's better. Now she can get back to her favourite activity, eating. Come spring, the sheep have been herded to a different location, but their ecological footprint remains. In summertime, the meadow is in full bloom, and with the flowers come the insects. When you visit the meadow at Warner, and can hear the grasses buzzing with life and see butterflies fluttering across the path, you can thank the sheep and their voracious appetites. But life cannot exist without death, and death provides a job opportunity for the animals at Warnham. Recycling. In time, this dead shrew will return to the soil with the help of flies and organisms too small to be seen with the naked eye slowly breaking down the carcass but the biggest recycling undertaking occurs later in the year. As summer becomes autumn and the trees drop their leaves, the recyclers are on overtime to turn the golden carpet back into soil. Autumn decay is overseen by a different form of life, fungi. The majority of the fungal life cycle is often spent underground, but now many of Warnham's fungi have the energy to build structures to spread their spores. The fungi push their fruiting bodies through the cracks of rotting wood and up through the earth, forcing their way out. Overnight, Warnham's forests are transformed into a dark fairyland. The most iconic toadstool is the most sinister, Fly Agaric. Fly Agaric is said to be the fuel for the Viking Berserker Ages, bringing warriors into a frenzy that made the Vikings so formidable. Next time you take a walk through Warnham, know that the fungi are there, even if you can't see them, forming networks like a metro line under the ground. What started out as a humble mill pond has become a sprawling metropolis, overflowing with life of every age and form. Warnham is the perfect case study on how nature reserves are bringing biodiversity back into Britain. But don't just take my word for it, come and see for yourself. <laughs>